The Life of Pi catapulted author Jan Martel into the literary spotlight. Now the Hollywood spotlight is shining as the book about a boy and a tiger in a boat becomes a feature film. NMIF correspondent Kevin McDonald sat down with Jan Martel while the film was in production to talk about watching a book become a movie and Martel's new novel. Let's get right into your new book. It's, it's actually about a year old, but now out on paperback, called Beatrice and Virgil. And for those who may not know about it, I could try to explain it, but I'm interested in hearing sort of how you describe this book to people who don't know about it. Uh, the shortest description would be to say that it's an allegory on the Holocaust. It's an animal allegory on the Holocaust. So I try to look at the Holocaust represented, but not in the conventional way of bearing witness. Instead, trying to look at it through the prism of an animal allegory. You can see it right on the cover. There's two animals. There's a monkey and a donkey. Those are two of the key characters. And, and of course, you're sort of known for the animals in Life of Pi. Uh, animals featured prominently there, also an allegory. Mm. Um, I guess why this sort of approach, using parables, allegories, that sort of approach, and the animals? Why does that work for you? Well, the animals, because they worked for me. When I wrote Life of Pi, I just found that I liked using animals as literary devices. I mean, I do like animals in for themselves. They are beautiful, and especially wild animals, they're mysterious. But as a literary device, I found them very effective because an animal can both be itself, you know, in Life of Pi, a tiger is just a tiger, just that, literally, factually that, but it also can be something else. It can symbolize something. We read a lot into, into, into wild animals. And so that, to have a character that, uh, whose interpretation can be so wide, so varied, is just useful for, for a writer. And I also like that a few adult writers use animals. They're not very exploited in animal literature, in, in, in adult literature. And so I also like the idea that I, I, I don't work in a crowded field. So uh, that's why I also use them in Beatrice and Virgil. And my next novel will also feature animals. So in each case, I find them a really interesting way to look at the human condition. So we'll come back to that next novel. I'd love to hear about that. Does it, do you feel like you may be typecasting yourself, though, as oh, the yes. animal author? <laughs> yeah, but it's, that's, it, to say that three books have similarities would be like saying three novels set in Ireland have to be the same because they're set in Ireland. You know, yes, because, uh, precisely because animals aren't used very much in adult fiction, people may just say, oh, the guy who uses animals. But each one is so different. I mean, Life of Pi is very different from Beatrice and Virgil. Beatrice and Virgil will be very different from the next one. And I've heard you talk a lot when you're talking about the animals, too, that part of the thing that attracts you to that is that we don't pile on as readers a lot of stuff when we see an animal as a character, no, the context right. of who they are and what that baggage is. Does that also, um, though, complicate trying to bring some depth to those characters then for you? Perhaps, although you made a very good point. We are very cynical of our own species. We know, we think we know each other very well, so we tend to very quickly typecast people and stop thinking about them. And that's a great challenge for a, a writer who tries to make a character believable. I found so far with animals that because they clearly symbolize something, I've usually found, or in my experience with Life of Pi, people are, readers are willing to come halfway and start involving themselves. So for example, and I, I mentioned this example in, in Beatrice and Virgil, if you have a character who's a rhinoceros dentist, the reader's intrigued. Why rhinoceros dentist? Why the rhinoceros? What does that symbolize? And that image of a rhinoceros dentist amuses, intrigues readers. And so the, I, I found they're willing to come halfway and start interpreting, start, you know, projecting what they know about rhinoceroses, what they think about dentists, and you know, what they posit might be the meaning of a rhinoceros dentist. So I found it very rich, and I, uh, certainly with Life of Pi, Life of Pi took off way beyond my expectations. I think it was in part because of those animal characters. People, readers, found them very engaging. And in Beatrice and Virgil, it is a different spin on the animals too, because mm -hmm. in, in this book, they're actually part of a play within the book. And, and they speak, they're, they're very anthropomorphized. Right. In Life of Pi, they were not. The, the tiger was a real tiger, behaved in real biological ways. With Beach and Virgil, yeah, they're, so the two speak English. They, 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 they are very, they, they are human beings disguised as animals. I use that ploy. So it is an animal allegory in a more conventional sense. It, it, they're not wild animals as they were in Life of Pi. And so, which leads to what we'll talk to in a minute about Life of Pi, which is the movie, but in terms of using animals in this way, what do you think about this in terms of a play? If this play within the book was actually to be acted out, what does um, making these animals more human, how do you think that would translate to the stage? Well, it, once you stage or film something, it, it becomes more literal. You know, for example, that's the, I love cinema, so I'm happy Life of Pi is being turned into a movie. 
it'll gain in being a cinematic spectacle. The one thing that will be lost, however, is that imaginative liberty that readers had in interpreting the story, even to the, in terms of the visual elements. So, for example, I never describe Pi. The character of Pi, what he looked like, whether he was tall or thin, had a big or a small nose, was completely irrelevant to me. But once you turn it into a movie, well, you need an actor. So from now on, people, when they think of Pi, will think in terms of the actor who plays Life of Pi. Just as it's very hard for people now to think of Harry Potter without seeing Daniel Radcliffe. So it kind of boxes in how we, we see uh, the characters in a story but it brings all the power of cinema. So, I don't mind it in terms of Life of Pi. In terms of Beatrice and Virgil, it'd be absurd to try to do it literally. To have a character dressed up as a monkey and other dressed as a, as, a be as, as a donkey would be kind of farcical. So I think it's probably best as a play in one's imagination. And along those lines, um, with the play within the play, there's a lot of things going on in the book. You have the play within the play, and we also have it it ends with some games yes. and we'll talk about that a little bit but, but i think before we do that we need to step back and talk about as you mentioned this is an allegory about the holocaust right. which is always a, an interesting and delicate area to jump into and so i'm curious why you wanted to uh, write a book about the holocaust and why you wanted it to do it this way and in a fictional way that's a big question uh i've always been interested in the holocaust i'm not jewish i'm not european my family's been in canada and quebec for over 200 years but when I first learned about it, it's a tragedy that stayed with me. Other episodes of history you read about, you learn about, and then you forget. The Holocaust stayed with me, and uh, my entire adult life as a reader, I've regularly read about the Holocaust. And I, as soon, as, uh, soon after starting to write, I, I thought I one day wanted to write about the Holocaust, do something creative with it. But I never found an entry point. I never found something that I was comfortable writing. And it was as a result of writing Life of Pi, in which I used animals, that there was a, a click, an aha moment. And I, I thought, if I can't approach the Holocaust in uh, human disguise, perhaps I can approach it in animal disguise. And once I made that decision, my, my nervousness at taking on the Holocaust fell away. Um, and why did I want to do this particular treatment? Because I noticed quite rapidly that we, 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 uh, the ways we see the Holocaust are very limited. We tend to think of the Holocaust strictly in non-fictional terms. So the writers that we associate with the, right, the Holocaust are people like Elie Wiesel or the great historians. We don't tend to think of novelists and poets. And that's very unusual. If you think of the way we portray war, war is portrayed in any number of ways, some of which have nothing to do with the reality of war. We allow ourselves war romances, war comedies, war thrillers, we allow ourselves, in a sense, to trivialize war. And why? I think it's because we think there's the event, there's a war, let's say, and there's the way we represent it. And we feel that if we represent it in many, many ways, we will get to some understanding of war, how we feel about war. We haven't done that very much with the Holocaust. We tend to limit it always in the same way. And I think that's at a loss. We gain by representing an event in as many ways as possible, because hopefully each way will bring something different. And so I thought the animal allegory having been so rarely used with the Holocaust, hopefully might bring something that other books have not brought to it. And, of course, no critic, not all critics are ever going to like anything anybody no, 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 does. No, not at all. This and is divided critics a lot. Divided critics a lot. I'm just wondering because, of course, the, the protagonist in your book is also an author who's dealing with the same sort of issue. He wants to actually write a book about the Holocaust that is right. half fiction, half nonfiction essay. And when he takes it to the publishers, they shoot him down very quickly. Right. And um, I just want to read a passage and then sure. find out if this is sort of your defense um, for those critics about this and uh, if, if this is because you expected sort of some of that to come. So let me just read uh, from the book, uh, Beatrice and Virgil. You say, my book is about representations, and this is Henry in your book talking, um, of the Holocaust. The event is gone. We are left with stories about it. My book is about a new choice of stories. With the historical event, we not only have to bear witness, that is, tell what happened and address the needs of ghosts. We also have to interpret and conclude so that the needs of people today, the children of ghosts, can be addressed. In addition to the knowledge of history, we need the understanding of art. Stories identify, unify, give meaning to. Just as music is noise that makes sense, a painting is color that makes sense, so a story is life that makes sense. Is that sort of your built-in defense of those? Absolutely, books? absolutely. I think, um, you know, few of us are, are historians. Few of us have a sound knowledge, and if we do, we're historians of something very narrow. What's wonderful about art is that it can get to the essence of something, 
while not being so concerned with the facts. And the purest example of that is through allegory. So I'll give you an example to make concrete what I'm saying. Animal Farm by George Orwell. It's a delightful fable set on this farm concerning these animals that take over the farm. It's an allegory on what happened to Russia under Stalin. Now Stalinism, the history of Russia, is a vast complicated topic. Most of us wouldn't be interested because we're not Russians or we're not interested in Russian history. What the allegory does, what Animal Farm does, is it takes the essence of what happened and transposes it to a setting that's much more easier to read about, and it gets to the essence of what happened. So you don't may know nothing about Russian history. You read Animal Farm, you know what, Russia, what Stalin did to Russia. The use of violence, the use of coercion, the use of propaganda, the corruption of an ideal. So uh, generations of British school kids have read Animal Farm, and they may know nothing about Stalin, but they know what happened, and hopefully having read Animal Farm, they'll be inoculated against it. They'll be able to recognize Napoleon, who's the lead pig who corrupts Animal Farm. So what's wonderful with allegory is it can, in a very compact, powerful way, it can teach us what happened somewhere else at another time. And as I said, I think we need that for the Holocaust. We can't always let it leave it to the historians and the survivors. Those are necessary elements. We need the historians and the survivors. But I think we also need the artists to come in and play their role. And people are suspicious. Aren't, as I said, the critics have been very divided. You know, the New York Times absolutely hated the book. Um, it was very odd for me to see literary critics disempower themselves and say, you cannot use the tools of literature when it comes to the Holocaust. That was very odd for me. That was a very, very peculiar thing. I, I, and it's a misunderstanding of art to think that art denatures an event. We, artists just take a different route. They're not so worried about the facts, but they're, if it's great art, if it's good art, they're concerned about the morality of something, the essence of it. And that, you know, it'll speak for itself. If, if people feel that it represents the Holocaust, then it's, an, it's a Holocaust novel, even if there's no factual representation of the Holocaust. And that's really part of the message too, right? That because for a lot of people, especially young people, the Holocaust is just a historical event. It's becoming that, yeah. And that's inevitable. You know, the river of time swallows everything. Every historical event fades, gets covered with dust. In some cases, you know, we perhaps feel we've learned from it enough, or we may feel it's irrelevant. I don't think the Holocaust is entirely irrelevant. And I'm not saying that for pious reasons of, you know, the, the suffering of the victims. Yes, there is that. But I concretely think there are lessons that we still haven't learned from it. You know, uh, um, there are Holocaustal things. You know, when we think of the Holocaust, we think of the Auschwitz, six million, the chimneys. That, I don't think, will be reproduced, for example, in the United States. But things that led to it, you know, the use of propaganda, the subverting of democracy, uh, intolerance, those are still very contemporary. And so I, I think it's not so much the Holocaust, the end point that needs to be remembered. It does, of course, but my focus is more on things that led to it, in the intolerance. Uh, those things are still very contemporary, which to my mind still makes the Holocaust a, very much a contemporary event, the way war is. War is an eternal thing, whether it's a couple divorcing or an outright war between nations. It's something that in a sense is contemporary. I think, unfortunately, as a result of things that happened in the 20th century, so, so is genocide. We mustn't keep genocide that far away from our consciousness. And surely today, especially, we're seeing what's happening in Libya and Tunisia yeah. and these places. These things are constantly playing out. Yeah, yeah, and we have to keep it. But, you know, but let's remember also, Beatrice and Virgil is also just a novel. It's a story, and people can interpret it any which way they want. There also, there's also an animal element in it. Right. that people, Some people read it and don't even realize it's about the Holocaust. They think it's about the environmental the, the destruction of the environment, and that's fine with me. Right, because the, the words, the Holocaust, aren't in here, except for when Henry's talking about the book he's trying to write. Right, 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 Beatrice right. and Virgil have a whole exchange about what they should call what happened to them, and they exactly. came up with the horrors, yeah, exactly. which makes it more universal. One of the other things I found really interesting, and there's this great exchange with Beatrice and Virgil when we first meet them in the book, and it's about trying to explain to somebody who doesn't know what a pair is, what a pair is. Mm. And I'm just wondering if there's, if that conversation is supposed to reach further to say that the Holocaust is something that we could try to explain all day long, but really it's an unexplainable event and we're just trying our best to make some sense isn't even the right word of it, but yeah, to explain. Absolutely. Readers are, are free to interpret things how they want, but what, I'm, what I try to point out in that scene is because often people, when they approach the Holocaust, are silenced. Constantly in Holocaust testimony, you, re you hear the words, you know, there are no words for, it's undescribable, it's unbelievable. And um, the problem with that is that if, if, we, if we feel that words aren't good enough, we lose everything. Of course words are not good enough, and I use as an example the describing of a pair. If you've never seen a pair, you could expend 10,000 words 
nothing will match the reality of a pair as an actual pair. Describing will only point arrows, be, you know, will, will be weak. They're not enough. You have to, have to intuit your way and try to figure it out. Same thing with describing. It's even worse than describing a monumental event like the Holocaust. Of course words won't be good enough. But it's all we have. Because the Holocaust has disappeared. It's been swallowed by time. All we have are representations in words. And if that's not good enough, well, that has to do. And so we have to take words for what they are. They don't replace reality. They merely try to point at it. They merely try to represent it. And so we have to accept that that's the limits of what we can do. And therefore, we don't have to so much despair and fall into silence. We just have to work on our representations, which is why I argue uh, books that take different takes on the Holocaust are essential if we truly want the Holocaust to live in time. It's a, bear with me on this question. It's, it's uh, putting you on the spot a little bit. But sure. do you view this book as um, optimistic or pessimist? pessimistic? And I ask that because there's also a lot of talk about change in here. You have mm -hmm. Henry, your protagonist, who you start the book and he's kind of got writer's block and is sort of stuck. Mm -hmm. And you have Beatrice and Virgil who've been through this horrible experience. And at one point, Henry asked the person who wrote this book, which is a lot to explain, but who wrote the play, I should say, how have Beatrice and Virgil changed their experiences? And his answer is they haven't at all. They're exactly the same as they were in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then the person who wrote this too is seemingly going through some change at the end. You're sort of left vague on whether or not he's had any change in his heart or not. Mm -hmm. And so with sort of that backdrop, do you view your book as pessimistic, optimistic, or you just want the reader to figure that out in their own perspective? Well, the reader should always figure things out in their own perspective. Uh, well, you know, the, the, the Holocaust is a monumental tragedy. And so, anything about it will bear a weight of pessimism. You know, that six million innocents, one whom of whom were children. I have a 90-month-old son. Well, you know, one quarter of the victims of the Holocaust were children. So out of that, there is no joy. But it's past, and so there's the obvious lesson that it should not be repeated. And there's also, what can we do with this? Once we've gotten beyond the sadness, and that's often how people react to the Holocaust. They have this overwhelmingly emotional reaction, and they forget to stay with it and then get to a more intellectual one, a more thoughtful one. After the big emotional crying, you have to calm down and go beyond that. You know, what Wordsworth said about poetry, emotion and tranquility re recollected. So, uh, uh, and after that, there perhaps can be some optimism, you know. In, in having that emotion and then having thinking through it, perhaps we can come to a better place where we will remember the victims and make sure that we, it doesn't happen again. So, you know, it, it, is a, it is a grim story, but in that grimness there can be elements of hope. But as you said initially, it's up to the readers to figure out what they're going to do with this book. Right. Um, lots going on, not only with this book, but Life of Pi, as we mentioned. First, I just want to ask you a little bit. Uh, it's hard to believe, but Life of Pi was 2002, correct, when that right. came out? Yeah, how did that change um, life for you as an author and approaching a book like Beatrice and Virgil? Well, Life of Pi made me very busy. I mean, my first two books didn't sell very much. Life of Pi sold enormously all over the world. So I spent two years, you know, traveling, uh, you know, celebrating it, you know, going to book launches, literary festivals. I love that. So it made my life busier, more complex. In terms of my uh, process as an artist, it didn't change things. Uh, after two years, I closed the door on all the noise to do with Life of Pi, and I got to work on Beatrice and Virgil. Every book's a different book. It has its challenges. Uh, so every time it feels like it's a new book, like it, like it feels like it's a first book. Uh, so the creative process hasn't changed. Um, there was no, other than the fact that there are animals in both, the creative process uh, was otherwise a, a brand new one. And Life of Pi had no bearing on the writing of Beatrice and Virgil, just as Beatrice and Virgil has no bearing on the next book. You know, each time it's a discrete creative process. And ultimately a book is created in silence, in a quiet space. And the outer noise, whether it's the noise of success or of failure, is irrelevant. You'd like to take on the big issues, though? <laughs> I do. I mean, you know, I, I studied philosophy at university. I, I believe in, in literature. As entertainment, of course, every book has to be entertaining. Hopefully people will read Beatrice and Virgil and be entertained. But also I think it's an amazing tool to explore the human condition. It's an amazing tool. It's the greatest, you know, the novel is the greatest tool to understand people, the world, civilization. You know, the best way if you want to explore 19th century Russia is to read the great 19th century Russians. Nothing will convey another, a foreign reality, or even a, a, a local one, than a novel. Because a novel is a mixture of thought, emotion. A brilliant novel does what nothing else does. So I believe in that. So uh, uh, I take a lot of time writing my books. I invest a lot in them. 
And hopefully if the reader gets something out of it, that's great. If they don't, that's fine. I, I do it in a sense for myself. And now it's being translated into a movie, Life of Pi. Yes. Is that a little bit like handing off a child to a, a stranger to raise? <laughs> um, not really, because the book remains. Mm -hmm. uh, the movie's being done by Ang Lee, who's a brilliant, brilliant director and filmmaker. I trust him. Uh, it's a very good screenplay. I've read it twice. It's a good screenplay. The, the Fox 2000, the, the studio, is fully backing the movie. So my hopes are high. And it is an adaptation, you know, it is different. You know, the novel is 300 pages, the screenplay is about 110 pages, all of dialogue. So, you know, some things are lost, but some things are gained. I love cinema. I grew up on cinema, so my hopes are high. Ang Lee is a brilliant film director, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's being released on December 14th, 2012, so there's a, a ways yet. They just started filming a couple months ago. But I think cinema will bring something to the story uh, that obviously isn't in the book. And... Um, Will it replace the book? I doubt it. You know, usually the, the two go hand in hand. If it's, a, if it's a good movie and a good book, they usually both coexist happily. What are those things you think that the cinema will bring to the story? Well, the, the visuals, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, um, yeah, cinema can do things visually that a book just can't do. Uh, you know, some things will be lost, of course. Now we'll have to see Pi. Pi will be imper you know, personified in a way that he isn't in the book. Um, a movie always simplifies some of the thematic depths in a novel, but the visuals can make it really powerful. You know, the descriptions of the Pacific, the descriptions of the, the, of the movement of the waters, of the, of the animals underneath the water, that'll be made incredibly powerful. So it, it, it can get very, a very powerful uh, uh, encapsulation of a book. And if people like the movie, then they go on and read the book, and then they'll get the full experience. And, and you started that process a few years ago with an updated version of Life of Pi that had some illustrations that yeah, went with it. illustrated version, yes, yes. Did that sort of prime you for this? I mean, it's a separate thing. See, whereas I, I say that the, the movie will sort of box in the visuals of the story, the illustrated edition doesn't, in part because the illustrator was brilliant and we never see Pi himself. Things are seen through his perspective. So you never, you see Pi's hands, his, his feet, his legs, but you don't see Pi himself. But also their illustrations, they are beautiful paintings. And like a painting, you look at it and you interpret it. It's, it's, you know, it's a more active interpretation than a movie. And a movie is slightly more pacifying. You sit there and it's all brought to you. It's an overwhelming experience. A painting is more participatory. You have to involve yourself. So they're, they're lovely illustrations. The, the illustrator, Tomislav uh, Torjanac from Croatia, is, is a brilliant, brilliant illustrator. I was very happy to be working with him. And how does that process work in terms of deciding this is where we need an illustration and figuring well, those sorts of things out. There are certain imperatives that are, you know, you can't have three illustrations in a row and then nothing for 80 pages. So they have to be spaced, you know, uh, roughly equidistant in the, in the narrative. And then you have to find something that lends itself to being illustrated. So one thing that's illustrated that's very useful is the lifeboat itself. You know, one of the limitations of language is describing objects. I said that about the pair and breaches of Virgil. It goes, it's the same with the lifeboat. You can, you know, spend so much time trying to describe something. I describe a widget or something. Nothing does it like an illustration, like a photograph. So uh, Tomislav, we spoke and he, he illustrated the lifeboat and it's, it, it is the way I meant it to be. And so that's very useful. People will see it and right away will get it, whereas I spent paragraphs trying to describe it. Or for example, to describe a sea anchor or, a, or a, um, I forget what the dove, uh, thing that, that filters water. I forget what it's called again. Um, I blanked out. But anyway, it's illustrated there and you see it and now you understand what it looks like. Whereas I describe it and I describe it and it's very hard with words. So, uh, you know, it, it's it, the, the Life of Pi, the illustrated edition, I was very happy with. I thought it was, it was a beautiful book and the illustrations very nicely complemented the text. What happened to those pieces of artwork? Well, they were, uh, they were a mixture of, he, he uses paint, but then he uses computer. He also uses computer. So they did these beautiful prints. I, brought, I bought some of them and uh, otherwise they're in the books. But I believe Tomislav has a number of them, and uh, the, my British publisher did some prints of them, and so I can't remember how many copies there were, but I bought one series, and uh, they're, they're perhaps still available. Is there anything about the movie that, in the back of your mind, you're just worried about, oh, this could really mess up my vision for this? Any one major thing that um, you worry about at all or could well, see? Well, the complexity, the subtlety of the story, the, you know, the intellectual, questions that it asks. You know, it could all go wrong. You know, uh, I said that's why I'm happy that it's Ang Lee. He's a brilliant, uh, you know, sober uh, filmmaker, highly intelligent, highly sensitive. Uh, but, you know, it can all go wrong. You know, that's, that's the, you know, it's such a gamble. So much money, so much time. It could either be brilliant or terrible. In fact, that's what I suspect it'll be. It'll either be a brilliant movie or a terrible one. I don't think it'll be middle of the road. 
Um, if it's terrible, does that impact? No, because you know, the book? no one blames the author of a book for the the movie adaptation. Um, it's the film director. It's the studio that bears the brunt of the both the the, the, the blame, but also the reward. But as I said, Ang Lee is brilliant, and the producer Gil Netzer is a, is a very able producer. So I suspect it'll be something surprising. And how much can you tell us, fill us in about what's next for you? Oh, I can tell you lots. I always like talking about what I'm working on. The next one will once again feature animals, this time a chimpanzee and a rhinoceros. It'll be set in northern Portugal. And I'm interested in looking, um, it'll, as always, it'll be vaguely if quite elliptical, but I'm interested in looking at teachers, the role, the, the role of great teachers in our lives, whether they be you know, teachers in history, let's say like Jesus or Karl Marx, or literally teachers that we had in high school, the great ones who really marked us. What do we do once they go? Whether it's Jesus is strung up on a cross or Karl Marx dies or, you know, we graduate from high school. How do we keep the teachings of a teacher alive once the teacher is gone? How do we prevent it from becoming um, uh, stultified, you know, turn into dogma, into rigid dogma? How do we keep wisdom alive when the wisdom giver is gone? I sort of want to look at that. And particularly, I, I, I take sort of the, 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 the great teacher, in this case it's, it's, it's Jesus of Nazareth, who in a sense would be the archetypal teacher. He came, he spoke, and then he, he, he left. How do believers keep that wisdom alive? And it's a you know, challenge that Rome constantly deals with. And I, I don't mean it to be a Christian novel. I'm just using that as an example. It would apply to every other teacher, as I said, whether it's how the teachings of Muhammad, the teachings of Buddha, and the teaching of your, you know, your grade 12 chemistry teacher. You know, how do you keep that wisdom alive? And I'm looking at that using uh, um, many elements, you know, uh, chimpanzee, rhinoceroses, automobiles. It's set in northern Portugal at the beginning. It starts in northern Portugal at the beginning of the 20th century. It sounds totally implausible and crazy, but so did Life of Pi when I was working on it. And Life of Pi worked. And in fact, I'm as excited about this next one. It'll be called The High Mountains of Portugal. I'm as excited about it as I was about Life of Pi. And when can we be looking for that? Oh, I've just started it. I mean, okay. uh, having a baby and doing these right. tours it takes some of my time, but I'm really excited about it. So it'll be a lot faster than Beatrice and Virgil. I'd say about two years or so. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll be looking for it. Thank you. Ian Martella, thank you so much, and enjoy your time here in Albuquerque. As always, we're thankful for you, our loyal viewers. We're back next week, so until then, enjoy your weekend. I'm Gene Grant. We'll see you next week in Focus.